प्रणोदेवी सरस्वती वाजे वाजिनी वती धीनाम विवतु ओं वाग्देव्य नम नमस्ते गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन माई टॉक इज गोइंग टू बी ऑन द सब्जेक्ट घर वापसी ए हिस्टोरिकल ओवर व्यू ऑफ हिंदू होम कमिंग I know it's a provocative and controversial topic let's jump into it the moment we utter the word ghar wapsi people tend to think that it is a modernist hindu really uh, revival ploy you know it's a it's a trick or it is something cooked up by the modern organizations like arya samaj or most recently the sangh parivar so they are alarmed and rattled genuinely by the demographic imbalance of hindus in india not just in india the indian subcontinent overall and so they are cooking up this idea of ghar wapsi well that's not true in fact uh, ghar wapsi whom i want to call as hindu homecoming it's essentially nothing but assimilation and reconversion into the fold of dharma of people who were estranged from it so this is not a modernist fad it has a very long history and in fact this very process predates islamic invasion of india there are evidences from the puranas as well as from the historical sources to substantiate this point there is this vedic ceremony called vratya stoma mentioned in brahmanas and later grihya sutra texts so the idea of this ceremony was that there were certain people who were called vratyas so someone could attain a vratya status because of not following vedic observance or slipping away on some of his duties someone you know who has become a bhrashta so to bring him back to the vedic fold and into the proper uh, community and uh, uh, traditional life there was this ceremony a kind of purification ceremony vratya stoma that has been advocated uh, many scholars believe that such ceremonies uh, are the inspiration for later ceremonies in the hindu history to bring back people who were estranged from the hindu dharma itself so both the vedic religion and the buddhist religions practiced this we have enough evidences uh, so for example the invaders and frontier tribes particularly those in the northwestern part of bharat they have been continuously assimilated into the body of hindu society from a very from very long times uh, for example there is this uh, heliodorus pillar which is in vidisha madhya pradesh it belongs to the late second century bc very old so it is a stone pillar with a garuda on top it's called garuda stambha so this pillar was erected by someone called heliodorus and it has this nice brahmi lipi inscription in prakrit language of the shunga period it it reads like this this garuda stambha of vasudeva the god of gods was erected here by the devotee heliodorus the son of dion a man of taxila sent by the great yona king antiyal kidas as an ambassador it goes on to me mention to which king's court he was sent as ambassador everything but the point is that so here is a greek ambassador 
who proclaims himself as the devotee of Vasudeva. So that's the key point to note. And he doesn't seem to have changed his name, interestingly. He is still Heliodorus, but he has erected this pillar honoring Vasudeva. So the Greeks and later Kushanas, Shakas, Hunas, Tartars, Baluchis, these are some of the tribes who, who were assimilated into the Hindu society. So, uh, for example, Kushana, Kushana kings, including Kanishka, they issued coins with the images of uh, Hindu deities like Shiva. And uh, the story of Mihirakula, son of Thoramana, who, who has been described as a very barbaric Huna ruler who defeated Shatakarnis in the battle. So he also later uh, came back to the, the Hindu fold. And the famous Rudradaman, the Shaka king, so he married a Hindu woman and then onwards his lineage continued in the Vedic path. So th there are many evidences like this from the history uh, for this. Now coming to the medieval era, so conversions to Islam, how did they took place, under what circumstances? So much has been written about it, but still uh, it, is, it is not spoken so openly in the Indian academia and in the public circles. It was certainly done by the sword through unspeakable brutalities and cruelties accompanied by a lot of horror and bloodshed. A lot of it happened through enslavement. So thousands of Hindu men and women were made slaves and transported all across the world. Of course, they were converted to Islam before this. So using enslaved women as reproductive tools to increase the population, so this has been a practice of accompanied with Islamic invasions all over the world. And then the humiliation, the sense of humiliation created under Islamic rule and economic burdens like the jizya tax, so contributing and motivating people to convert. So these were the means by which the conversions to Islam took place. But there is a deceptive propaganda by some Muslim scholars and also some biased historians. They say that the conversion was voluntary, you know, and the, the lower caste and oppressed Hindus were just, they got converted to Islam and found it as a way to liberate themselves from the shackles of the oppressive Hindu society. And then there is this peaceful, quote in quote, conversion by Sufis. And then the, there, are, there is a mention about uh, conversion by traders, specifically in the coastal areas, in a very peaceful manner without involving any war and bloodshed. And there is a comparison of how Southeast Asia, you know, countries like Malaysia, got totally Islamized without fighting major wars. And then there is a comparison with India trying to create a story that, uh, you know, Islam can also spread through peaceful means. But, but all this has been thoroughly exposed by multiple authors and books and historians. Uh, in the Southeast Asian case specifically, you know, till the conversion of the ruler officially to Islam, there were wars fought. But at a, at a threshold of a point, when the political power shifted to an Islamic ruler, the subjects automatically converted. That's how it happened. But before that, there was big, there were big wars. And in case of India, you know, just one author, uh, the famed historian K. S. Lal, has written multiple books: uh, The Legacy of Muslim Rule in India, Indian Muslims, Who Are They? is another book, The Theory and Practice of Muslim State in India. Muslim slave system in medieval India. These are some of the books by just one author. Uh, and that, there is a voluminous literature chronicling 
how the Islamic conversions took place by forceful means. Uh, it's, it's a much, and these books, they cite the Islamic historians and the Islamic diary keepers and the Islamic core documents themselves as their primary evidence. So, so there is nothing like, you know, um, trying to concoct a history here. So, after all this, why so many people in India are still Hindus? So, this is a question the historian M. A. Khan raises in his book. And the book is titled uh, Islamic Jihad, A Legacy of Forced Conversion, Imperialism and Slavery. And he answers the question. He says, even one millennium after the Muslim invaders came to India, the Hindus still unable to find anything appealing or worthwhile in Islam. They were ignoring so much privilege and inducements to convert to Islam. Instead, they were undertaking dangerous protests and still ending up paying humiliating jizya, onerous courage and other kinds of crushing taxes by doggedly adhering to their ancestral faith. Moreover, many of those who had converted to Islam under various circumstances, including at the point of SWAT, they were willing to revert to their ancestral religion at the earliest opportunity. He goes on and says, the historical, and, and he gives a lot of, you know, uh, evidence. He says, the historical records cited above make it obvious that the Hindus of India were never impressed by Islam, truly. Instead, the trend was exactly the opposite. That is, an eagerness to leave the fold of Islam to rejoin Hinduism all the time. On rare occasions, when a liberal Muslim ruler came to power and gave the citizens free choice in matters of religion, Islam declined and Hinduism and other local religions flourished. This is as admitted by Muslim historians and scholars themselves. So, this is M. A. Khan writing in his book. So, what were the factors facilitating reconversions in the medieval era? First, the conversions to Islam were far from being total and complete. In fact, even those who got converted, they had lot of traces of Hindu culture, language, manners, food, dress, everything left in them. And they also had contacts with Hindu communities still surviving and living and sometimes fighting in the neighborhood. And second, the Islamic rule never managed to secure a complete hold over the entire country. So, there were po pockets of Hindu rule and incessant resistance to Muslim hegemony in many places. And the third, the most important one, the social acceptance of reconverted people into Hindu communities. And the fourth was the Bhakti movement. So, the Bhakti movement offered a healing touch to the trauma caused by the brutality and tyranny of Islamic rule. The early Bhakti poets like Kabir Das, Dadu Dayal, Guru Nanak, if you read in their poetry, they will say Hindu Turak Nakoyi. There is nothing called Hindu and you know Turak means a Muslim. And they will, uh, their poetry condemns some of the evil practices of both the Hindus as well as the Muslims. But at the end of it, what the truth they ultimately preached was Hindu philosophy. You know, it is aligned to the Advaita and Nirguna school of Hindu philosophy and the values uh, like non-violence and uh, total surrender and Dhyana, Nama Japa and all these practices were essentially Hindu, but they clothed it in a language such that uh, it appeals to both Hindus and Muslims and also it will not aggravate the Muslim ruler because they are also praising Islam at times. 
they will say that uh, the, the God is known by the name Rama as well as Rahim, Allah as well as Ishwar. So this was a language developed by the sages and saints during this medieval era to clothe the essentially Hindu message in a softened language so that it will not aggravate the Hindu rulers. I think it is wrong to interpret that what they preached is similar to the secularism of the Congress and the leftist governments. Uh, and along with this, the Bhakti movement also adopted many novel methods, innovative methods and practices to preserve Hindu teachings and practice Hindu traditions, sometimes secretly, sometimes in a disguised manner, amidst this censuring and tyrannical rule. See, uh, for example, since the temples were all getting destroyed by the Muslim invaders, wherever they went, so gatherings like Kumbh Mela, which don't require a temple, but just people gathering in a holy spot, they developed pretty much in the North India. And so this is one example. And, and there were many, there were satsangs, instead of Vedic ceremonies, there were satsangs and Nama Japas, those kind of practices. And the wandering monks and sadhus, who had a major influence on the North Indian society, that, that tradition also developed during this uh, medieval period. And we see that uh, at times, these monks and sadhus could become warriors and they fought wars to protect dharma. All the way up to 1857 uprising of the first war of independence. So is this all theory? Is there, is there, was it codified or is it just, you know, made up story? No. We have this text called Devala Smriti. It was supposed to be written by a, a Smriti, Smritikara called Devala. So this was a Dharma Shastra text dated to around 10th century. Um, this was a time when the Muslim conquest had completed in the Sindh and the frontier areas and the Muslim armies were penetrating into the inner regions of India. So what does this text contain? So it's an exclusive Dharma Shastra text. It contains the purification rites and the rules and regulations for admitting those people who strayed into the Mlecha and Yavana fold. Of course, these words obviously refer to Muslims because around 10th century, there were no Greeks or Shakas or Hunas. There were only Muslims who was invading. So the terms Mlecha and Yavana clearly denote Muslims. The word Turushka, I mean, meaning the Turkish origin is also used at times. So one very interesting aspect of this Smriti is that it has guidelines for fully accepting and rehabilitating women. Even women who were carried away in raids and siege by Muslim armies and later rescued. Even if the women were raped and they had conceived and they had borne children because of the rapes by captors, Devala Smriti says that they have to be accepted along with the children after purification rites. So just imagine such a lofty humanitarian and egalitarian uh, guideline from the Devala Smriti. This is something which we cannot even imagine in the India today. So this itself implies that what were the crushing and hard times that the Hindu society went through, that it relaxed some of its rigid rules on purity and chastity so much. And it also proves that Hindu society was uh, very adaptive you know, for survival. So was it just theory written in a book? No. In fact, uh, uh, D.R. Bhandarkar in his book, Some Aspects of Ancient Indian Culture, he describes as an incident, an incident in 1398-99, you know, much later period, in South India, during the Vijayanagara era, there were 2000 Brahmin girls of a village. Uh, they were uh, taken away by the armies of Feroz Shah Bhamani and then they were 
later rescued and accepted after purification rites. So there is a edict recording this incident. So there is a strong historical evidence suggesting, suggesting that the guidelines of Devala Smriti were actually followed. And there are other texts, medieval Hindu law books like uh, Vigneshwara's commentary to Yagnavalkya Smriti, for example, that also contains, uh, you know, things like purification rites, etc. for this purpose. So, so, Hindu society was well aware of this problem and they had devised ways to tackle it. And a real classic case is the founding of Vijayanagara Empire, a very interesting case. Year 1326, Sirka, Sultan Muhammad Shah Tughlaq, he invades Deccan, he enslaves and converts two brothers who were chieftains of the Hoysala kingdom, uh, which, which, has, which is already in the diminishing stage, destroyed uh, during the raids of uh, Malik Ghafur. So these brothers are Harihara and Bukka. Uh, in, in colloquial Kannada, they are called Hakka and Bukka. And then Sultan takes them to Delhi. And once the, there is uh, uh, some chaotic situation and rebellion erupts in the Deccan region, he appoints them as some commanders in his army. He sends them back to Deccan to control the situation there. What do they do? They come back and they just return to Hindu fold. You know? They, uh, they seek the blessings of the sage Vidyaranya, uh, who later became uh, Mathadipati of uh, Shringeri Matha in Karnataka. He was a wandering sage at that time. They seek his blessings, they return to the Hindu fold and uh, they found this Vijayanagara empire on the banks of Tungabhadra. So they take a, a old dilapidated uh, city of Hampi and name it as Vidyanagara and Vijayanagara. And this Vijayanagara empire, it was a flourishing center of Indian civilization. It was a preserver of religion, culture, arts, and so much of heritage of South India. And it was a greatest impediment against Islamization of South India for close to 250, 300 years. And even after the empire fell, the, the chieftains of the fragments of its empire, the Nayaka kings ruled and uh, prevented their provinces to be taken over and Islamized by the Muslim army. So such was the impact. And you know, this, uh, so looking at the irony of it, one of the greatest Hindu kingdoms that prided itself as Hindu Raya Suratrana in their edicts. It was founded by two brothers who did Gharvapasi in the 14th century. And this is not just like some folk legend. Uh, historians like V. A. Smith in his Oxford History of India mentions this incident and says that it is very authentic. And coming to later times, uh, you know, during the rise of Maratha Empire and the Sikh upsurge. The power of uh, the Mughal Empire was waning. So we, we see some in instances of reconversion of uh, Muslim army general, Muslim noblemen and also ordinary people converting to Hindu dharma. Not in a mass scale, but there, there are incidents uh, recorded. Uh, so this is during the reign of uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji, uh, Bajirao Peshwa, all the way through Raghunath Rao. There are, there are small incidents. Uh, also, there are cases of uh, Muslims of Punjab adopting the Khalsa Panth during the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. But these were not in large mass scale. These were stray incidents. Perhaps because, you know, now the, the boundary between the Hindu and Muslim communities were so watertight and so rigid that the initial flexibility a few centuries back was lost and the reconversions became more and more uh, individual choices, but still they, they kept happening. And 
during the Dogra rule in Kashmir uh, in the 19th century, there is this incident about uh, the Kashmiri Muslims willing to return to the Hindu fold. But the Kashmiri pandit, pandits completely resisting it and intimidating the Dogra ruler that they will commit suicide if the ruler uh, allows the Kashmiri Muslims to come back and get the status as the Kashmiri pandits. So this is a very controversial uh, uh, info. This is quoted by Veer Savarkar in one of his books. Uh, but I, I haven't found any, you know, a solid historical evidence for this incident, but it is, it is mentioned by him. So this perhaps shows that uh, there is a psychological, ba psychological barrier among Hindus that one sudden day they simply cannot forget all the atrocities uh, of the Muslim rule and the cruelty uh, of Islam and simply accept people who were genuinely willing to come back to the Hindu fold. So next we come to the modern era. We have the famous Shuddhi movement of the Arya Samaj. So as we know, Arya Samaj, as uh, the movement founded by Swami Dayananda Saraswati, called for uh, radical reforms within Hinduism. So it proposed go all the way back to the Vedas, even to the point of rejecting Murti Puja and Puranas and the later developments in Hinduism. And they Arya Samaj, as a social reform movement, wanted to accept all people into the Hindu fold, you know, even those uh, who were discriminated by the mainstream Hindu society. So there were these Shuddhi ceremonies in Og already. So they were used for purification, uh, as a purification ceremonies for people who lose their caste, caste purity. Uh, by some sacrilegious acts like for example traveling abroad. So traveling abroad was considered as a, a Shastra Virodha. So whoever had done that, he will just do this Shuddhi ceremony, get purified and then he will be accepted. So these were already in vogue. So Arya Samaj took them and they adapted this for admitting, you know, untouchables and uh, the, the scheduled and depressed scheduled uh, caste and scheduled tribe communities as they are called today, uh, who were subjected to untouchability during that time to bring them back into Vedic samskars. So, so they used to do perform the Shuddhi ceremony to them and give them the sacred thread and also taught them Vedas. So this was the, the adaptation, a very innovative adaptation. And then they got a little more ambitious. They extended the same Shuddhi ceremony to, they transformed it to bring back people from other religions, especially uh, from the Muslims into Hinduism. So why did they do that? Because uh, in the Gujarat, Rajasthan and Sindh, Lahore, those areas where the Arya Samaj was very active and vibrant. There were a lot of borderline Muslim communities uh, in the northern and western India. So they, they were Muslims, but they still had lot of Hindu traces not erased. They, they will go to mosques, do namaz, celebrate Eid, but they were pretty much uh, Hindus in the cultural sense. So they wanted to target such borderline communities and uh, to educate them about uh, uh, you know the, the, the truth of uh, abrahamic religion especially islam so the more radicals among the arya samaj they started undertaking a big uh, propaganda drive they wrote books highly critical of islam and circulated it among these borderline muslim communities so one great name uh, in this regard is pandit lekram he wrote uh, a, a treatise criticizing Quran and Prophet Muhammad in chaste Urdu, Urdu, citing the primary uh, Arabic sources from Quran. So this book was called uh, Risala e Jihad, Yani Deen e Muhammadi ki Buniyad. 
so this book created a lot of stir in the region and uh, there were lawsuits filed against pandit lekram in british courts and there was a pitched legal battle uh, and british courts allowed the pamphlets and the books to be distributed so this agitated uh, the muslim fundamentalists and fanatics greatly and mirza ghalib who was the founder of ahmadiyya sect uh, you know uh, which is today ostracized in pakistan so he was highly infuriated by the arya samaj pamphlets and he instigated uh, muslim crowds and eventually pandit lekram was murdered by a muslim fanatic Uh, in a reaction so as a as a reaction for the shuddhi movement the the muslims started what is called tabligh it literally means propaganda movements so suddenly they realized that people who had uh, converted to islam few centuries back they still didn't uh, properly follow the islamic tenets or they did not understand even the basic uh, precepts of islamic religion so the tabligh was to educate muslims and make them into true and pure muslims so this uh, in a lot of sense this is similar to the wahhabi movements uh, right that we see in india and many parts uh, of the middle east also uh, to erase all the indigenous traditional aspects of muslim culture like the dargah worship or uh, the music and dance and some sufi elements uh, in the islamic culture that had crept in remove all of them if needed even by violence and preach uh, uh, arab supreme supremacist version of islam so that was exactly what was tabligh all about so this kind of put a break into the effort, uh, efforts of arya samaj but arya samajis were not the ones to give up swami shraddhananda he was the first hindu leader uh, who properly understood the danger of muslim demographic takeover of india if not checked and he he wanted to really do something solid to counter that effect so he invigorated the shuddhi movement in a very big way and it had some great successes so around uh, it is estimated that about half a million malkana rajputs were uh, they returned to hindu fold in 1922 in a grand ceremony in agra and the kshatriya mahasabha accepted them into their community and gave the status of hindu kshatriyas so there was some reluctance and assimilation issues in the next uh, one or two decades in accepting them but eventually they got fully integrated into the hindu fold this was a great success but when they attempted the same thing with uh, the mewath rajputs it was a partial success because tabligh had uh, gained more inroads into th those communities and such mass reconversions arya samaj could not carry out there is also another reason for that Uh, swami shraddhananda just like pandit lekram was murdered uh, brutally in 1929 by an islamic uh, fanatic in fact that was uh, followed by subsequent murders of more arya samaj leaders so this intimidated a lot of people and isolated arya samaj from the rest of the hindu society who feared for their life if they get involved in the shuddhi movements so this greatly slowed down uh, the arya samaj shuddhi movement and eventually it diminished swami vivekananda is generally known as uh, you know the one someone who spoke for the universal religion of vedanta and the harmony of religions across the world and the mutual respect among religions very true what were his views on reconversion into hinduism so there is this interesting interview uh, that appeared in prabuddha bharata uh, a magazine founded by swami ji so this appeared in april 
it goes like this so the, the interviewer goes and asks swamiji i want to see you swami on this matter of receiving back into hinduism those who have been perverted from it see look at the word the interviewer uses he doesn't use the word convert he actually uses the word pervert is it your opinion that they should be received swami ji says certainly they can and ought to be taken then the interviewer writes he sat gravely for a moment thinking and then resumed then swami ji says besides we shall otherwise decrease in numbers and then every man going out of the hindu pale is not only a man less but an enemy the more the vast majority of hindu perverts to islam and christianity are perverts by the swad or descendants of these it would be obviously unfair to subject these to disabilities of any kind why even born aliens have been converted in the past by the crowds and the process is going on these were the views of swami vivekananda so it, it it's clearly evident that he not only endorsed gharvapsi movements uh, but also highly encouraged them so there is a very important question in this regard that is being asked even now is caste an impediment for reconversion or is it an impediment to becoming hindu this is a genuine question but it, instead of uh, uh, as a free enquiry it is generally asked in a very ridiculing tone you know implying that as if the indian christians and indian muslims uh, do not have any uh, any jati or caste divisions they were all like one solid block like muslims or christian and only when they want to come back to hinduism they have to worry about caste this is far from truth uh, if you take indian christians the caste identities for most of them are very well known and the ancestry is also very well known because these conversions took place just two or three generations back uh, in a few exceptions like uh, the, the kerala christians perhaps 5 uh, 6 centuries back but still their caste identities as a separate group are preserved and known most of them declare it openly uh, for example the fishermen communities of coastal tamil nadu they still remain fishermen the uh, and uh, many recent converts into christianity in what is called a crypto mode they keep their castes alive for uh, you know the reservation and other government benefit purpose and they don't even officially convert to christianity uh, and announce it in the gazette as it as it is required by the law so so among indian christians caste is very much alive and when you come to indian muslims the caste evolved and changed over a much longer period but still it is traceable in most cases that is because most of these muslim converts continued in their traditional vocations or occupation like julahas of up the weavers for centuries they remained weavers and they had their caste and in bengal all the traditional occupations in which the muslims were in when they got converted they are still in the same vocation in most of the rural belts and other places uh, in case of indian muslims there is a very clear distinction between the arab turkish or persian descent versus the indigenous uh, converts into islam you know the sayeds sheikhs qureshis for example there is a there is a very clear social division a distinguishable one between the non indian ancestry versus those who converted to islam from indigenous indian communities so such is the case with indian muslims so to say that 
you know only when someone wants to convert to reconvert to hinduism the caste becomes an issue is is not really a valid point and in fact according to swami vekananda in the same interview what he says is that when the converts returned to the hindu fold they simply went back to their earlier castes this is what swami ji speculates and he says in some cases they created new castes as among some vaishnavas of bengal and eventually those castes also got integrated into the hindu society so you know the verdict is that uh, the jati or caste is not really an impediment to becoming hindu neither in the past nor in the present nor will it be in the future and if you take the case of those who are becoming hindus from non indian backgrounds like westerners or even some blacks in african countries uh, they anyway do not have a need for caste because they are not living in the indian societies and they can still follow the hindu religious and spiritual practices so some uh, what is the recent scene on reconversion and ghar wapsi so regarding vanavasi communities i mean the tribals of uh, odisha madhya pradesh jharkhand chatisgarh and the dong district of gujarat uh, many communities who were fraudulently converted to christianity they have been brought back in a, in a, in mass in some cases by the valiant work by the likes of uh, dilip singh judev of madhya pradesh the prince of madhya pradesh swami lakshmanananda of odisha and uh, he was murdered uh, by naxalites or some people even believe christian fanatics Uh, in a very brutal way and swami asimananda and organizations like vanavasi kendra of rss so this was a, a success story and if you but in case of northeast uh, it is uh, there are there has not been much of reconversions in fact uh, whatever tribal communities that got converted in the northeast over a century it started over a century ago and continued for decades uh, some places like nagaland have become so much christianized that uh, they are like uh, some of the medieval fundamentalist christian countries in the europe the, the way the freedoms are controlled the way the, the people's lifestyles and everything it has gone back to perhaps an irreversible kind of state Uh, so currently the effort in the northeast is more of prevention and deterrence against christian evangelism and propaganda rather than reconversion and uh, targeted mass conversions in some hindu communities uh, you know including scst communities and also uh, some uh, dominant castes like vanniyars of tamil nadu or reddies of andhra pradesh to christianity or islam that have happened in the past few decades the, the famous meenakshi puram mass conversion episode in the 1960s where uh, almost half of the village was converted to islam uh, the, the sc communities through gulf money that created a big stir all over india uh, in districts like kanyakumari of tamil nadu it has happened and andhra pradesh and even in punjab where the deluded uh, youngsters who are into drugs and other uh, you know they are they are not able to reconcile between their uh, lifestyle versus the teachings of the sikh dharma so they are targeted by the christian conversion groups so there has not been much counter measures no notable attempts to bring them back into the hindu fold but reconversions at individual and family level or being reported here and there uh, through gazettes and also in the popular media at times if the celebrities are involved so the, what are the reasons for this It, marriage is one of the reason uh, attraction for hindu cultural and devotional aspects uh, quest for freedom particularly in case of women uh, spiritual quest 
that could be a reason and also in some very rare cases it is due to the knowledge about the true characters and teachings of Abrahamic religions. So, you know, in the West, uh, particularly in the USA, so there are movements like ex-Christian and ex-Muslim. So, those kind of movements have really not started happening in India, uh, but th there, is, th th there is scope. So, I want to conclude my talk uh, with a very profound quote from Dr. Coenrod Elst on the subject. Uh, so, this, uh, this is from his book, uh, a short book called The Demographic Siege that he wrote in 1997, uh, where he discusses uh, the danger of India being, being taken over by what is called the Muslim demographic explosion. So, this is what Dr. Elst writes. So, actually in the book, he discusses what are really the ways to arrest this trend? And then he concludes, demanding, demanding as the project of reconversion may be, it is the only civilized solution to the looming threat of a Muslim demographic takeover of India a few decades from now. Of course, Hindus may be lucky and wake up one day to find that Islam has imploded from within. The Hindus were that lucky in case of communism, which surprised them with its implosion. So, it is really possible. You know. Then he says, nonetheless, luck rarely comes to those who count and depend on it for their survival. Then he goes on to say, uh, whether uh, you know the internet and the information revolution would even make people stuck to their uh, religious identities. I wonder if the present worldwide re revival of religious identities can at all persist once the information revolution has had its full civilizational effect. This he wrote in the 1990s, but what we see today is that uh, the information revolution, though it has helped in some way, you know, uh, to, to make people come out of their uh, closed and fundamentalist religious revival ideas, it has also sharpened them on the other end. So, now, now we see uh, even terror networks can actually be formed using internet. And finally, he writes, Indian Muslims. Um, so, I, I, I have uh, put, you know, whatever he says about Indian Muslims also applies to Indian Christians, I think. Indian Muslims should be encouraged to outgrow their religious conditioning and to explore the spiritual sphere afresh. This will automatically bring them in closer touch with their Hindu surroundings and help them reintegrate into the society from which they were estranged by Islam recently or centuries ago. So, this is how he concludes. With that, I end my talk.